graduate this evening. He completed his book seven, book eight, and therefore completing his Narconon Drug and Alcohol Rehabilitation Program. <laughs> seven months to the day this Monday and I'd like to say that a uh, majority of what I'm about to say is primarily directed at our new students uh, people in the first half of our program as well as some of the people about to start the second half of the program and I'd like to open with a very very well-known quote from the Rolling Stones you can't always get what you want but if you try sometimes <laughs> just might find you get what you need and this uh, has probably never been more true for most of us than right now at this moment whether you're a student here at Narconon whether you're a Narconon staff member or whether you're the family member of someone in Narconon you're exactly where you need to be right now so I just want everybody just to kind of cherish the fact that you're even sitting in this room right now Okay, let me get it together. Okay, so I just turned 26 eight days ago, and I have been doing drugs since the age of 15. And I told myself I was going to die with a needle full of heroin in my arm and a crack pipe in my mouth. Because at that point, nothing could bring a smile to my face. I mean, I'm not talking like nothing, not a meeting. Not a prayer, not a daily devotional, and most devastating of all, not the sunshine on my face or the blue sky. Now, I don't care how corny that sounds, or how fake you think that sounds, that is all I wanted from the bottom of my heart, was to feel the whole universe against my body in the form of the simplest joys in life, because that's what life is really all about. So, one day it happened, I, uh, I blinked my eyes once, and when I opened them back up, I was on my back with, with my father performing CPR on me, and he was hysterically screaming as uh, We got this. As the emergency medical technicians rushed in with the stretcher and started attaching wires to my chest. And oh God, I'm sorry, I didn't expect to be reliving that moment. And I listened with the back of my skull resting against the wood floor to those earthquake-like booms of the EMT's thick rubber work boots as they scrambled around looking for the drugs that did that to me. But in reality, it was not the drugs that did that to me. It was me that did that to me. Now later that night, in the hospital room, I found myself staring up at the ceiling once again. And this time, for the first time in my life, I called out loud to God to help me because I knew that I had lost complete control of my life. And that lack of control was destroying me, my family, and every single person that I came in contact with. So, I actually continued to get high for another two weeks. I, there was no way I could stop. I didn't want to be dosing. So, until I went back to the hospital to get my test results. And as I stared at them, reality hit me all over again, and I dropped to my knees in the parking lot stared straight up at the sky 
telling the universe to do exactly what it wanted with me, be it I get hit by a bus or space time itself ripped open to suck me off the face of the earth and just throw me over space. <laughs> because I just couldn't live like it anymore and I didn't know what else to do. And of course my dad fooled around and I got into his truck. <laughs> so, later that night, my mom showed me the information she had on Narconon, and I told her that I wanted to go to a place where I could go whitewater rafting on a wild river, <laughs> where I could ride horses, and where I could lay on my back at night and look up at the night sky, just listening to the stillness broken only by those little signs of life that we all take for granted. I had no idea what I was in for. <laughs> so, fast forward to my second day on book one. It was incredibly tedious to say the least. Uh, I was sitting in these chairs trying to do TRs and I'm sitting there nodding off and my back is killing me. And I started to wonder if I had made a terrible mistake. <laughs> but then, I got a break from TRs and got called into Rick's office for an interview. Now, Rick must have known that this was my one and only final chance to get this right. And he told me to take my life seriously because it wasn't a joke and not to waste my time or my parents' money if I wasn't going to do it right and live it because I didn't want to be back out doing the same exact thing all over again. And I walked out of Rick's office with a ferocious appetite for whatever what was thrown at me. And I walked, I walked out of that office. Onto the rest, uh, onto the highway of the rest of my life. And I came up to my first toll booth. And who was that toll booth operator but Gene Adams? <laughs> now, all I had to do was give Gene every single <coughs> microgram of trust I had in me. Now, I looked at Gene for a few moments, and within a seconds, I could tell that he was worth every single bit of trust that I had. Now, I put my trust in Gene, and Gene, in return, just did nothing but believe in me that I could walk that highway on my own two feet. Now, what he did was show me how to lift up that toll booth gate on my own. He didn't do it for me, he showed me how to do it. Now, nobody ever outside of my own family has ever shown me that kind of compassion. 